fourth episode of Green Drinks Jakarta. Uh, welcome back um, to, edu- uh, to everyone who doesn't know, Green Drinks Jakarta is now a weekly online session where we talk to different guests about all things pertaining to sustainability. And to you guys who are not um, familiar yet with Green Drinks, so Green Drinks is actually a global gathering for anyone who considers themselves green, whether they work in energy, conservation, policy, or entrepreneurship. So it's actually a global movement. Uh, But our team here, Green Drinks Jakarta and Jakarta, uh, is made out of volunteers working in various sectors and have previously held events at WeWork and Greenhouse co-working spaces. So we're usually, before um, social distancing is in place, we were an offline monthly event. Uh, To check out more about Green Drinks, you can uh, can open uh, our links. Let me check here on our comment. Okay. Okay. Okay, so our link is right there. And um, my name is Karina Gosumadewi and I will be your host for tonight. So most people might know tonight's guest as an urban farmer who shares a lot of gardening tips and a lot of stories from her sustainable living journey online. Um, but she is the co-founder of social enterprise called Kabun Kumara and I'll just invite her right now. Okay, so we're just waiting for our guest to come. Hi, Masandra. Hi, Karina. Hey, how are you doing? Tonight? I'm good. Do you have a drink with you? Because, I mean, our show is called Green Drinks Jakarta. I do, and I know it goes for one hour, so I've prepared my tumbler. Nice, nice tumbler. Okay, I've got some, like, juice with me, but it's all gone now. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so welcome to the show. It's so exciting to have you. Um, so you are the co-founder of the social enterprise Kabun Kumara. It's become so, so popular on Instagram. You always share a lot of stories. And now there's a lot of, you like ever since um, social distancing is in place, you guys have also published the series, right? This like gardening at home series online. That's really cool. Um, so like, can you share a little bit about Kabun Kumara, uh, like a short introduction of like what it is? Yeah, sure. So basically... Uh, in a nutshell, Kebun Kumara is an urban learning farm, um, and our our aim is to share a more sustainable lifestyle, especially um, to urban dwellers. So, being a, a city girl myself, I, I I was born and bred here in Jakarta. Our aim is basically to reconnect, I guess you can say, the urban society with what we felt has been a deep disconnection with nature, and we feel that gardening. Um, you know, producing your own food, growing your own food is the perfect um, first step um, for people who want to re-expose themselves to nature, reconnect with nature on a daily basis, and learn about uh, more sustainable ways to go about their days. Mm, so okay. what we do is we provide um, workshops. We, we do education. That's one of our, it's actually our forefront pillar is education. So we provide workshops, um, trainings, webinars. Um, right now, we're all, it's all going online, so no offline classes yet. Um, and then we also provide, we have Toko Kumara, so we provide seedlings, edible seedlings, um, our farm-made potting soil as well. So for people who need access to um, edible seedlings and potting soil, they can purchase it from us. And then we also have an edible landscaping uh, team. So for oh. private residences or even schools, anyone really who wants to have a garden and needs help in designing, even constructing the garden, we can help provide that as well. Right. So for landscaping now with social distancing in place, like is that still going on or? Surprisingly, yes. I think mm. this is uh, this is this, yeah this is quite um, something that I didn't predict as well. But with the pandemic, actually, we've had more requests um, for gardening mm. for landscaping services. So I think 
there is this um, maybe maybe you 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 felt it or you read about it a lot of people actually looking into gardening as means to um, more positive activities to fill their days because now they're at home um, longer they need activities Definitely. with their family they need activities with their kids they need activities for themselves right and so gardening has become the go to sort of healthy uh, positive outlet for a lot of people and so a lot of people are actually wanting to have a garden now Yeah, that's really yeah. cool. So, how did you even get into gardening or like farming? Because I know that your background isn't in agriculture. I know that a lot of people in yeah. Kumbun Kumara, their backgrounds are not in agriculture or farming or anything. Yeah, so like you. You were in Kumbun Kumara. <laughs> yeah, Karina was, was also. So, for everybody watching, Karina was also in Kumbun Kumara for a while. I mean, she interned with us. You interned with us, right? And then you you uh-huh. volunteered with us as well. Yeah, I yes. think that's the thing. A lot of a, a lot of. I know that I think that's like the majority of people live in the city. Yeah? We don't really have, um, unless you take agriculture as your studies when you're in university, you really don't have much agricultural uh, knowledge. And I think that the, it's the root of our country actually, but I think that we've been pulled so far away from it that we don't really connect with it. And so Kebun Kumara is just the typical city kids who didn't really grow anything before there was Kebun Kumara. And I think the reason why we wanted to start gardening was because we had so much, we had so many discussions on basically um, environmental issues that we, that we are facing, right? So we, um, Kebun Kumara was started by, as you know yourself, Karina, it's like, it's like a family. So me, Dira, my husband, and Alia and her husband, right? So it's like a sibling thing. And then we always discuss things. We always discuss about deforestation. We talk about, you know, plastic pollution. We talk about landfill gas. We talk about the... The problem with um, our TPA, Bantar Gebang, and all the waste. We talk about many things. We talk about palm oil. We talk about just a variety of environmental issues. But then we had to come to terms with the fact that we really didn't know what to do about them. Like we just felt completely disempowered, and we really just um, just we're, we're privileged to to know these issues. We're educated enough to understand why these issues exist. But it's as if we don't know what to do. And I think one of the ways that we learned is to reconnect first with nature and and explore ways in that way. And so that's why we started gardening. Um, we I I learned I personally learned in Bumi Langit, so it's like a learning a permaculture learning center in Yogyakarta. That's why I learned about gardening. Um, I learned about sustainable lifestyle, about reconnecting um, with nature on a daily basis. That's where I learned everything. And I guess we when we had to. Um, contextualize the learning to what is it that people in Jakarta needs? How do you get sustainable lifestyle into the lives of the majority of people in the city? Because it's not easy, right? So what can we do? And what is interesting enough, or what is um, what is um, intriguing enough, so that people will actually want to put effort in reconnecting with nature? And we thought that gardening, from personal experience, was an effective um, outlet. Yeah. Right, right, right. So it's like the way that you channeled your frustrations and worries about the world, I guess. Yeah. So like yeah. what? So like all this time that you've been like gardening, like have you found something like quite personal in it? Like, cause I see, like when I see you guys like do gardening, like I see that you guys like really enjoy the activity. And even now, when you're not even like doing the farming yourself anymore, because your team has grown bigger, now you're you guys are like, oh my god, I miss actually gardening. Because now a lot of What you do is like a lot of admin, computers, classes. Right. So like, what do you miss about gardening? What do you like about it? I think well, I think gardening is a very peaceful sort of a meditative, um, therapeutic platform. I think it's sort of like, I well, this is a very personal anecdote, obviously, because I think people will find their own little zen somewhere else. Some people it's yoga, other people it's running, some in swimming, right and So it's it's different for everybody, but I think because gardening is you reconnecting directly with nature, like you you and the plants, you and the soil. There is this intimate, um, direct contact yeah, with 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 nature. I think that's 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 where um, it, that's like the positive for me. And right now you're you're right because a lot of especially up during this during this I don't know like the new normal like the post pandemic era, everything is online, right? So we're we're still Our our farm isn't isn't open for offline workshops yet because we still want to see um, how it goes with the Corona 
um, numbers rising. We don't want to mm. put anyone at risk, even our team or even the people who come, right? So mm. we're, we're just still doing things online for now. And you're right, it has it has taken a lot of our time. Um, replying mm. emails, um, preparing presentations, um, IG lives, right? Because it's mm-hmm. it's it's. I think it's, it, this is the new normal. Actually, everybody going online. Every you yeah. know, everybody is talking virtually. And so that's why in Kebun Kumara, we feel that it's so that it's not ironic that we have a garden, but we don't garden. So we have a Tuesday sort of gardening session with the team. So oh. I'm actually forcing the team internally <laughs> to have a morning where nobody's in front of their laptop, where everybody's in the garden. Everybody has to pitch in. Everybody has to do something in the garden. They have to maintain it. They have to plant something in it. They have to harvest something. They have to, um, maybe they can cook something in the kitchen. So something just a collective effort because Gardening is a collective affair. It's a very social affair. It's not you and the plants alone. It's more than that. And so I don't want to. I don't want that to that value to weaken, right? Mm. So we're trying. We're trying to find the balance. I think that Tuesday thing is working. Um, I mm-hmm. felt that it, we just tried it out this week actually, and I felt that the team was re-energized. So I think we'll keep that going. Yeah, I think I really like uh, what you said about uh, gardening as a really social activity. Because, like, at home also, like, just, like, one person gardening starts to kind of, like, echo in the home. Like, my dad starts to garden, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to join yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, when you harvest, you yeah. automatically, like, har- uh, like share your harvest with, like, everyone around you yeah. as well. So it's really nice, like, a, a positive, like, wave, I guess, to the people around yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. So not a lot of people might know this, but I think you posted about this like quite recently about uh, your experience teaching. So you were a pengajar muda, a young teacher uh, with uh, Indonesia Mengajar, right? And you were away for uh, a year teaching in a remote island in Maluku in the village Lumasebu. And yeah. I wanted to... Oh, yeah. yeah. You memorized yeah. that, huh? <laughs> of course, it's the name of your dog also, Luma, right? And yeah, Beirut. Yeah, right. you That's forgot how you named your right. own dog. No, no, yeah, I did. I did, actually, for a second there, I did. <laughs> but anyway, so I wanted to ask you, like, so did, so that, that experience was, like, from a few years ago, right? So did your experience, uh, you know, living the island lifestyle, very remote, did that affect how you saw life in the city? Um, yeah, what did you find there when you were there yeah so it's weird actually because um it's a volunteer sort of platform so you volunteer for it right and they they, they go through a rigorous selection process and then i have i'm just lucky that i was chosen but i think that that program brought so much benefit for me because before i i'm i was very secluded i guess from the from the real portrayal of what it was that Indonesia is facing. And I think that's what we all face when we live in the city, right? People who live in Jakarta, we tend to live in this little bubble and we're somehow culturally closer to that of the States, of the US, of Europe, right? Of Australia. We're closer to those cultures. Like we know what's happening there. We know the education there. We read their news compared to, you know, some remote village in our own country, right? So there's this barrier that we're not, right? It's true. And there is no access. Like back right now, maybe you can get access a lot online. But then it was so difficult. I had no idea. There was this island called Tanimbar. And this this is partly because the map that I had, had the island wasn't even on the map that I had. What? Yeah, so I bought the map. And then on the map, the island wasn't there on the map. (laughs) That's one thing. And the second thing, maybe I'm just ignorant, right? I mean, I should know, but I didn't. But, um, even when I Googled, when I, when I was deployed, so you, there were so many places that you could have deployed, that you could have been deployed to, and I was deployed to Tanimbar, and then I Googled it, and I didn't really get much information. There wasn't even any, there was a couple of blog posts of people who've been there on like tourist um, vacation sort of thing, but I didn't really get much information of what was happening on the ground, just the basic detail of the population count. Right, the um, the the general uh, climate stuff like that. So it wasn't really it wasn't really personal. It wasn't really about the social characteristic of the place and whatnot. And so the reason that I wanted to join um, in the first place because I understood that I was living in this unrealistic bubble, and that I needed to step out of my comfort zone. Basically, I was I felt mm-hmm. stupid in a way because I didn't know anybody outside the big cities, and I felt that that would be such a great weakness on my part. Like if you just stuck, if you just stay in your bubble, right? I mean that's 
that that would weaken you in so many ways, not just in 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 your knowledge, in how cultured you are, in your behavior and stuff like that. So I really wanted to join to get that sense. And then when I was there, I thought it was heaven because they had no electricity. They were, we had electricity from a private generator, so it was only two hours from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., which was heaven because everybody would sleep at the same time. There was no noise pollution, right? Ah, uh, like, yeah. It's perfect. You can hear sort of like the bats. You can hear the grasshoppers and just like the night crawlers. It was nice. Um, everybody tend to wake up really early. Everybody got out of the house. They went, they saw the sunrise, stuff like that. So it was very lively. Aww. There was no reception. So I didn't have the phone <laughs> with me at all times, which is great, right? <laughs> um, I think people don't understand. I think people need to experience the blessing of having no reception because it's, it's a complete, it's like, the, it's like a real life basically. Yeah, so you interact with people, yeah. you don't interact with your gadget. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I thought it was great. I thought it was an opportunity of a lifetime. So I, I was very lucky to be able to join that uh, platform. Right. And what do you think, uh, so aside from like disconnecting from um, the online life, from like your gadgets and stuff, like what do you think the city life is um, missing? Like what did you find, like what kind of privileges did you find in the villages that you didn't find in the city like about our lifestyles like did it did it change your point of view about I mean because everyone sees the city as like oh it's like the good life it's like luxury but do you think there are things that are missing in uh in the city life that is present in a uh, village life oh and I think uh the collective is it I don't know about collectiveness is that a word I think the um the social connection, I guess. Okay, uh, okay. How, how things are more of a collective affair than they are of an individual affair. I think in cities, you tend to be more independent, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in village life, everything is everyone's business. Yeah, um, it's mm. the, collective, the collective effort is there. Everyone, everyone sort of um, tunes in to the needs of each other. They're very sensitive mm. to problems that others are having. Uh, they they are they they are easier to lend a helping hand because they know exactly what's going on around them as well. So the exposure is very close, very tight knit. I think right. I think those are always the advantages of living in a more. Um, it doesn't have to be rural. It could be it could be coastal, but it, more of a traditional village life. That's always a benefit when you have that 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 that. Uh, immense and deep intimate connections with with other people and it's interesting Car, because if you watch i don't know i forgot who who it was by but it was a ted talk and then this person basically tried to define happiness right and he was talking about the happiness index whatever um mm -hmm. uh, the well-being index of, of nations and whatnot and then they did research on what is it that actually makes people happy is it money right is it um knowledge and whatnot and people found out that it's actually social connections meaningful social connections ah. so Right. It's about the quality of relationships that you have with people around you. And if you're in a city yeah. and your relationship is based on just the one-off, how are you, what's up, you know, the WhatsApp messages or whatnot, but you don't have a true connection, so you can't share all your problems with this person, you, you don't know if they will come to help you if you share your, if you share your problems with them. You know, the, the, the trust and the, the bond that's probably missing in a lot of the relationships that we have in the city, it, it exists when you live in a village. So yeah. that social connection is, is, is so strong there. You can feel it. I can feel it. Even when I was there in one year, they, they gave me that. So it was actually, yeah, it was magical in a way because I was a stranger, right? They didn't know who I was. I just came in their village. Um, I thought what I could, and then they just took me in. So I, I, it, was, yeah, it was a blessing. And I think that, that connection, that deep connection in village life is truly the, something that we, the city kids, can learn from. Mm, yeah, that's so interesting because, yeah, I guess city life is like really ironic in a way because like you're you're surrounded by so many people and you're supposed to be connected with like your gadgets, your social media, but actually yeah. you're more yeah. and more disconnected. And as, yeah. I mean, aside from people, you're also really disconnected from nature, right? From nature as well. And actually when, so uh, if you guys don't know, Kabun Kumara was actually uh, featured in the film Samasta. Uh, we've linked it in our Instagram, but uh, I'm going to quote you here, but I'm also going to translate. So in the film Samissa, you said, if the issue is city folk being disconnected from nature, then in the city is where we should find the solution. So, 
So is that what you were trying to do with Kabun Kumara? Like, how is Kabun Kumara bridging that gap? How is Kabun Kumara connecting people back with nature now? Yeah, because the city produces a lot. We are basically the source of so many problems, right? We demand so much from the system. We demand so much from industries. We use so much of what is produced is for the city life. And then we throw it all away, right? We produce thousands tons of um, trash every day and we send it all to the landfill, to the ocean and whatnot. So the city life is responsible for a lot of damage that we've done to the environment. And so if the city life is responsible for that, then the solution must exist in the city, which means that the solution must start with the people who live in the city. Yeah, and I think that, that has been the problem that we analyzed and that we believe truly is one of the causes that we wanted to change or we wanted to uh, contribute towards creating betterment in. And that's what I think, that's what we feel Kabun Kumara, once we analyze where our role would be best, I think our role would be best in trying to get sustainable lifestyle across to more urban dwellers. Mm, right. And so like, how are you doing that? Uh, so like through educating people, through workshops and like online, I guess, to making content about gardening and stuff? Yeah, so at first, at, at the start, we always do, our workshop was always the, the, the grand idea because we're talking about behavioral change, right? And you can't really change, you can't really start a new habit unless you get the people to, to realize why they need to start the habit. So that's why education is key. Awareness building is always key. And that's why education workshops, um, the sharing of information was always one of our key pillars. Um, right now, we're trying to get more information out there that is free. So now we have a lot. We have, so basically with things sort of settling in, because as you know, with, with, with small businesses, sometimes at the start, you just really have to focus on getting your business running, right? Once mm -hmm. things settle, things sort of have their system in place. Now we can have, we can create content that's free. So we also have free content on our Instagram page at Kabun Kumara. So if people do not want to attend our workshops, for any reason whatsoever, if they can't, um, then they can just access our free content and learn about gardening from there. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. And also, I guess with your landscaping project as well, in a way, you're helping people start uh, growing their own food in their own homes, right? Do you usually uh, do workshops with people at home as well? Yeah. So people who, will, um, people who request our um, services, you can say, to help them design their garden, to help them construct their garden. We do workshops in their homes as well. Um, because sometimes, in, as you know, when you, in, in a house, it's not just basically the owners of the house, right? You have the house assistants. Sometimes you have the gardener or the pool boy or whatnot. It depends on the house. But I mean, you have other people living in that house other than just owners of the house. And so it's very important that when you set up a garden, when you set up a composting system, everybody's involved. Because everybody will need to understand why this thing is here. How do we take care of it? Who maintains what? So workshop is very, um, it's, it's engraved in our um, landscaping services as well. Right, right. Because education is really important in trying to change people's minds and to teach them like a new way of living, I guess. Yeah. So you've been trying to live more sustainably for a few years now. Um, so I know that you've just had uh, a baby boy. Congratulations, Ms. Andra, on baby Thank you. Yeah, so how, what is it like being a new parent, being a new mom, whilst living more sustainably? Is it quite tricky being a sustainable parent? Like maybe going, you know, a bit zero waste towards zero waste? Yeah, yeah. It's extremely tricky because um, I think, <sighs> motherhood yeah um, so you just have to find the balance because a sane mother makes a happy child right if the yes, mother is all yes. cuckoo and crazy because she's all like sustainable living and then go for the environment and then she's all tired and the baby no one's gonna take care of the baby so i have to stay True. sane and so i have to strike that balance so i'm i'm trying to find what works um i understand it's not perfect i'm, I'm not perfect i'm not an eco warrior or anything i try to strike the balance like i don't for example, I still use um, diapers at the moment, but only during the night. So during the day, I'm still using um, cloth diapers, the one that's washable. So that I use. Oh, nice. And then I try to limit the diapers to only one night 
So as as long as possible, I keep changing the cloth diaper. But if I'm just completely exhausted, I don't want the I don't want to skip changing if it's wet either, right? So I don't want to I don't want yeah. Biru to sleep in in a wet cloth diaper. And I'm trying yeah. out other ways. For example, I'm trying the Cody. Um, Biru doesn't like to sleep in it though um, because it's it's a bit thick. Yeah, Cody is Cody is. Is it's not thin, so it's like a bubbly, uh, reusable diaper. It's sort of puffy. So is Cody like, like a traditional for... diaper? No, so Cody is like a washable diaper, basically. So you wash it, okay. but it's not a cloth, so it absorbs longer. So it's like a mm-hmm. diaper, but a washable. Okay. But it's a bit puffy. I got good bit idea. So it's yeah. a bit puffy. Yeah. So I'm just I'm still trying to find a way. I'm also trying to contact this this um this community who actually accepts. Your diaper, and they turn it into um, bricks. So I'm trying oh, to right. con- connect to this community, so I can yeah. give the diaper to them, so it, my diapers don't end up in the ocean. So yes, yeah. yeah, so I'm just trying to find a balance that strikes um, um, the motherhood phase. Yeah, it's, it's right. very tricky. I salute all the mothers who found it. Um, I have no judgments on the mothers who haven't found it. I mean, it's it's very yeah. tricky. Yeah, 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 I'm sure. Like I'm sure, like being a parent yeah. is like hard enough already. So yeah, you don't. You know, it's it, you definitely need to balance for the sake of your own um, like sanity, I guess. Yeah, but like whilst you're like a parent now, like does it change your view about uh, living sustainably, about the environment now that you actually have you know like a child who's gonna live long into the future, maybe you know long after you're not in on this earth anymore? Yeah, I think it it yeah it it in I. It gives context to the things that I'm reading, right? I mean, you know this. Greta, Greta has been preaching about how we only have until 2030, so it's 10 years from now that we need to stop the level of carbon dioxide from increasing. If not, the generations that live to inherit this earth will inherit an earth that has reversible, irreversible changes to its climate and whatnot, right? So we're facing literally a climate crisis, and this, mm. this is not just faced by Biru. But it's also faced by me because I will only be 40 by then, right? So I'm, I'm hopefully I'm right. still alive, and if our parents are healthy, they'll still be alive as well. Like they'll be 70 something. So it's not like their era; it's also our era. So it puts it puts what I read into context with the child hmm. being as young as he is and him being what just 20, 30. So that's 10 years. He's, he'll be just 10 years old and having to live in a in a in a, in a planet that is worse off. Right, with yeah. more plastic in the sea than fish, that's that's completely unacceptable in a way. So um, I think it's more urgent than ever that we, that everybody, that me personally, needs to really commit to mm. doing what I can do um, optimally and I and maximum in in my maximum capacity every day because I'm actually mm-hmm. fighting for Biru as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think we had a question earlier from Dwina. She's asking, "Do you have any tips on how to start um, like gardening in Jakarta?" Okay, yeah. First of all, you have to um, observe the sun, the sunlight conditions in your house. So, are you getting sun? Okay. If yes, where? For how long? So you have to observe that first. If you're getting right. Sunlight exposure for six to eight hours, then that's a good spot for you to start planting edibles um, in your space. And then once you want to start planting, then you can just mix your own soil. You can make your own soil mix. So you can buy that. Um, they sell it everywhere. They sell um, rice husk, even if, uh, smoked rice husk and the raw rice husk. Um, mm-hmm. So you can buy each component individually and then mix it, or you can just buy a ready-made potting soil, for instance. And right, then for right. the seedlings and, and seeds, basically, that, right? yeah, if you want to buy it from us, <laughs> we we're happy to make the mix for you. You can buy seedlings or you can buy seeds. So it really just depends on um, how how much time or energy you want to um, commit to that effort. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. So uh, paying attention to the sun and then taking care on like how to make your own uh, potting mix, I guess. And also, like, yeah. you need to think about water yeah. as well, right? Source of water. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so you need to, the plant needs to be watered twice a day before 9 a.m. and after 4 p.m. So you need to think, we also need to think, whoever wants to garden thinks about their schedule. Are you available to do that? If not, if, some, if, if not, 
is someone else at your house available to do that for you? So you need to consider that as well. Right, right. Okay, cool. And like for everyone else, if you want to find out more about like tips on gardening and like how to start gardening in your own home, you can check out Kebun Kumara's IGTV. They have a new series all about gardening at home. So check that out. Um, and now as it is like, you know, the pandemic is going on and um, social distancing is in place. Um, do you think, you know, you, you've been living sustainably for a while now, like before the pandemic, you've been growing your own food, trying to reduce uh, your waste, um, and like you have your own compost bin. So ha did that affect, um, like, did that give you like an advantage during uh, the pandemic, during social distancing? Or is it, or has social distancing made it challenging for some reason? Hmm. Or is it all the same? So, yeah, it's quite all the same because you know that I quite, I socially distance myself anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right? You sort of know that, right? I'm <laughs> such a homebody. Like, I like being at home. I like gardening. Um, I don't watch too much TV because I hate all the news, right? I hate all the nonsense. I hate the fear-inducing news. And then I, I stay at home. Um, I play with the dog. I watch YouTube, funny videos. So it's really... Um, gardening and being at home has always been sort of the, my, my status quo even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I guess during the pandemic, it just proves even stronger that when you have something positive to do at home, right? Yeah. You're not yeah. going to, you're, you're less resistant to stress. You're less resistant to um, extreme changes that might otherwise create psychological discomfort. So I think if you yeah. can create your home as a sanctuary, not just for your physical needs, you know, to rest, to eat, whatnot, but also as a good psychological space for you to grow and to, to go inward, uh, to meditate, sort of have mm -hmm. peace and relax, then it's fine. Pandemic yeah. or no pandemic, you should be able to ac access that. Yeah, yeah, right. And like, I'm going to share like a little bit of a funny story, I guess. Like when the pandemic started happening, I immediately, immediately thought of this like, series I used to watch, The Walking Dead. Because it's like, oh, you know, an it's like an apocalypse. <laughs> and then they have to start a new community. And then they started growing their own mm. food. Like, they go to the farmer. Because, like, the farmer knows how to, like, uh, grow their own food and stuff. And then, like, when I was, like, thinking about... And this is, like, I guess before the pandemic. I thought about, you know, like, oh, if, like, an apocalypse happened. Like, I, I have some, you know, food growing in my backyard. Uh, but then I'll definitely also, like, trade some seeds with Sandra. Because that's where all the plants are. <laughs> Yeah. And then, and then the pandemic happened. I was like, oh my God, it's happening. It's happening. I need to start growing everything right now. Um, yeah. So I guess thank you for the skills that you've taught me. Um, yeah. But thank God, like, you know, the system markets are still open as well. So we have choices. Uh, Gojek is still around as well. So we're not like stuck in this like single choice, I guess. Um, yeah, but we could have, so, right? We could have been, Dokar. Could have been. been. We could have had a food shortage. We could have had um, a, a, we could have had a lockdown where we couldn't have access to food. I think this yeah. I think this pandemic sort of accentuates the priorities that we need to have in life. Basically, you need food. Period. And yeah. if things like this happen, that it's out of sight, outside of our control, that you that you as a part of the society can't really you, you always depend on other sectors to supply you the food. Then the big question is, what happens if the industry stops? What happens if um, transportation stops if there's a lockdown where will you get your food so yeah. this pandemic is, is sort of also a, a slap on the face to all of us who ironically don't know how to grow our food right so it's it's, mm. it's more important now than ever for everybody to learn because it's basic need it's, it's like your survival kit you need to be able to grow food so that in case you know, when when bad stuff hits the fan, you know how to survive on your own and you know how to stay in your family at least for a while, you know, until that yeah. that that crucial critical phase is is is, um, is resolved, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's really crazy how like us in the city, like we don't really have any food coming from the city itself, right? We always outsource it yeah. from somewhere else, from Bogor, even further, even like imported stuff from uh, overseas. So it's kind of crazy and uh, quite unnecessary because, of course, like we can just like grow uh, anything in our own backyard. Like uh, our land is so fertile, tropical. We get, you know, yeah. like 12 hours of sun a day. So much energy and resources that are available in our doorsteps. Um, so like how, so like what is Kabun Kumara's 
vision for the future for city life do you want is your vision to have a city that can like pr produce their own food can be like self-sustaining well i think it's a twofold so we want um, well, me personally, I think it'd be great if people who live in the city are more mindful of, of, of their behaviors, of our behaviors. So we understand truly that whatever it is that we do have a direct impact on, on nature, which directly impacts us back. Um, I think the behavioral changes need to be made. We need to have accountability of, of our waste, for instance. We need to have accountability of, of the things that, that is creating detrimental implications to other people like near the landfill or even to nature right so we need to have those awareness awareness um, building in the city we need to have behavioral changes in the city we need to make it um, we need to make it sort of a culture again for us to understand that living sustainably is not a trend it's not it's it, it's a lifestyle it's, it's part of our culture it's what humans should be doing anyway right so mm -hmm. to really connect with that that's important that's the first fold the second fold would be um in the, the greater city setting it would be great if we would if we could if jakarta or whatever big city could have a system in place that creates a csas or communal communal a community supported agriculture so it's like it's like nice. communal gardens mm -hmm. right so we we share our knowledge um, people can start producing food, albeit just a little, but to small communities surrounding around that area. So you don't have um, you don't have like um, seventeen thousand hectares away from Jakarta producing corn just for Jakarta. You can have little plots of land mm. across Jakarta producing little stocks of the basic things that they need, and that little mm. uh, communal garden and communal spaces providing for the closest circle around them, right? Because it's always better to provide little but to the closest yeah. uh, circle around you compared to giving it to an industry that provides and monopolizes the whole chain of production. And then once that industry fails, the city has no supply of, of what they need. Yeah, so that's, that's always the, 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 that's always what we, the ideal scenario would be if cities could start being more, um, uh, playing a role in its own sustenance. Mm, okay, okay. And here's another question. Um, so how can we support more locally grown produce? Okay. Well, there are so many outlets now. So if you go online, there are, I guess you can say online shops or delivery services um, who, who sources directly from farmers. Yeah, so they, they buy the garlic from farmers, they buy the rice from farmers. It's, um, it's, it's all local and they sell it uh, and, and then you can choose the, the produce and they deliver it to your house. So there's so many outlets, both online, uh, mostly online, actually, so that you can get local produce. If you go to a supermarket, obviously, you'll have, uh, it's, it's, you'll have to sort of be diligent enough to read the, the, the labels to know where it's produced from because our supermarkets are filled with imported goods. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, more imported goods maybe than, than local goods. If, it's, if you mm, go shop at a crazy. supermarket. Mm. If you shop in a traditional market, like pasar, pasar BSD, pasar modern, gitu. so the traditional markets, those produce are mostly local. So you don't have to oh, worry yeah. about imported or, or local. Yeah. Right, but right, if you're right. looking for local and you want to know where it's sourced directly from, you can, mm -hmm. you can find that online. A lot of online places already provide that. Right, right, right. Cool. So there's, you know, go to traditional markets or pasar moderns around. Uh, and also there are deliveries online, I guess. And I guess some tips that I got from Melissa Kuara, our first guest of the first episode of uh, Green Day yeah. Jakarta, is that once you start Googling stuff about uh, these services that you're looking for or like on Instagram, the algorithm will work for you and like start suggesting similar stuff. So actually, you know, yes. you can make use of the algorithm to your advantage. Yes. Uh, so you just yeah. have to go to one profile, right? You go to one profile that you know. For example, my friend, her name is Buki. She lives in Jogja and she has a store named Ranah Bumi. Ranah Bumi mm -hmm. Catalog. That's the Instagram. Itu toko klontong. Toko, klon, toko, toko klontong. So basically, they don't, so they, it's free, free of packaging, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a free, it's like a, I don't know what it's called. Pokoknya, it's, 
everything she provides are in jars. So you go there with your own containers, basically, and you just buy what you need, and then you, it's calculated per grams. So granolas, um, locally sourced, everything locally sourced, um, herbs, spices, garlic, whatnot. Um, so right. you can buy it in, in, in a shop like that. So, for instance, if you Instagram that, then Instagram will work out for you and give you more stores that are similar to hers. Yeah, definitely. And also, we've got a suggestion here from like one of our viewers from Jason. I think Jason said pasar semen untuk sayuran for vegetables, and then muara karang for fresh seafood. So muara karang is like uh, North Jakarta, I think, right? Yeah. So fresh seafood. So it's all around us. You just need to be uh, to do a little bit of searching, and you'll find it. And also, I think online there's Happy Fresh as well. I think they do uh, like fresh veggies. Uh, from like local farmers and then there's also a kipir so if you guys just like google that uh, sayur box on, sayur box as well yes there's so many just start searching them and the algorithm will do the work for you so there's a lot out there so I'm sure that they would really appreciate the support uh, like more the more popular they are they are the more demand there are uh, the more of these services will start popping up so we have to you know uh, support mm. our local businesses yeah Yeah, I think it would be great. I don't know. This is a good question because sometimes I I try to look for it myself. It would be so great if there is an, uh, an somebody who basically compiles all the Instagram pages that does that, right? Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody should really compile like a list. I know that there are also a lot of um uh, like sustainable or like environmentally conscious uh, users on Instagram as well who list. Uh, make yeah, lists, yeah, yeah. Uh, those kind of lists and also like maybe lists of vegetarian or vegan uh, places around certain cities so you can check that out okay so our time is about to be up do you have anything okay. to say to our viewers before we close or maybe can you share some tips for people on how to be more sustainable living in the city or otherwise um, if they've never started before okay I think living sustainably is a very broad term and sometimes a little scary for a lot of people because the word sustainable is always so, um, what is it called? Intimidating, right? Sustainable, right? You have to, it's like you're doing everything right. You're finding balance. But I think every one of us will have our own hurdles. You just need to find whatever works for you in your daily life. So for instance, not everybody can bicycle to work, obviously. Some people can. I know people who actually do that. Um, others can't. Same thing with um, some people can, um, I guess, ride public transport all the time. It makes sense for them. Others, it makes sense to have a car. But I think those things you need to find out for yourself what works best for you. But uh, there are some things mm. that I think should be a blanket for all, to be honest. I think composting is one. Um, mm -hmm. I think every household should compost because every household Definitely. produces trash, for instance. So I think if you want to start somewhere, maybe you can look into that because it's something that we all do. And if you start composting, yeah. maybe from there you, you sort of get the feel of, oh, it's actually very easy <laughs> to live more mm -hmm. sustainable. Yeah. yeah, okay. Oh, I guess before we close, I'd like to answer one last question from your Maha Guru, yeah. Krishna Kawakriyasi. He says, if we produce our own food, what will happen to farmers that God. are selling produce Why to? Is he asking Would they this? lose market? <laughs> What are you asking me this question? Because question. somebody, no, oh God, no, 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 no. He, he's asking me this. He's asking me this because somebody asked him this, right? Oh, this I is, see. This is, this, is, this is one of the simple. Yeah, it is, and it's it's one of the simple questions that people ask. If you start growing, then you will never buy from farmers again, and that's why I always say that farming is a social act. You never mm. farm so that you can be self-sustaining for yourself. It's never for that. Right when you farm, you, you it's a social act. You don't want to be disconnected from other farmers, obviously, and right. you just can't grow everything yourself. It's it's darn impossible. No one has the time. No one has the energy. No one has the space. Right? You can't grow mm. rice, cassava, all the herbs, all the fruits, all the vegetables that you need. So it's one, it's impossible. Two, if you do it, it's actually murder for yourself. It's suicidal. So it's you need to connect mm. and you need to understand that when you farm, Krishna, like what you do every day. <laughs> You are not not helping the farmers, so you are helping them as well because you're relating to their lifestyle and you're appreciating their effort more and you're appreciating the food more. That's a trick yeah. question. I know somebody asking that <laughs> and he's asking me. Mm. That's our guru, by the way, guys. If you see that yeah. person, it's called Kawe Dot He yes. is our Mahaguru, yeah. So you can learn so much from him. He's in Bali yeah. now. 
Yes, go follow Krishna at kw.kreasi, also Bumi Langit, uh, Bumi Langit Institute. Uh, so yeah, so I think that was a great uh, point to end on. Remember that farming is a social endeavor. Uh, so thank you so much for being my guest, Sandra. It was so lovely having you. And for everyone else, yeah, I'll likewise. see you next week. We'll have another special guest. Bye. Bye. Bye.